thank you so much, Eski. And yeah, I'm, I'm deeply honoured and grateful to be invited to uh, talk here today in front of all of you um, on a topic that I, I'm, I'm quite biased, but I think is absolutely fascinating. And it's something that I feel very honoured to be sort of working in at the minute. Um, you know, I feel like when, when you kind of think of explosive volcanism, you don't tend to think of stalagmites. And it, it's cool to think how we may in the future be able to link the two disciplines together. Um, and existing evidence certainly points towards us being able to do that. Um, so without further ado, I shall hop straight in. So when the sort of the main focus of my talk today in terms of the mode of volcanism is going to be um, explosive eruptions. So obviously volcanic activity spans a spectrum. You can have very effusive and gentle activity, or you can have these big ash rich eruptions that create these incredibly um, complex and really quite beautiful plumes that can um, enter the atmosphere. And these are loaded with not only um, ash particles, really fine ash particles, but then also gases as well, like um, sulfur, carbon dioxide, and all these sort of really potent volatile gases. Um, and as you can see, these eruptions are not small. <laughs> they span, again, a huge spectrum of magnitude. So I've included a few sort of well-known examples here. We've got sort of the eruption of Pinatubo in 1991 is a very well-known example. Um, this is a magnitude of 6.1. And when we say magnitude, that refers to the amount of material ejected. Um, so when you start with a magnitude of six with Pinatubo, uh, we also then have AFF in 20, um, in 2010, which was a magnitude of four. And then Le Soufrier was a magnitude of four as well. And then a few other sort of smaller examples that sort of range from between a sort of high magnitude three and to up to a sort of high magnitude four. And then we can see that volcanic activity is frequent as well. So you can see here every dot represents an eruption and then the size corresponds to the magnitude of the eruption. And you can see if, we, if we're here on the time scale, you can see that actually, unfortunately, our records of these eruptions becomes really quite sparse as we move back in time. Um, and this owes to a lot of different factors such as sort of the erosion of deposits. It refers to, you know, the um, sea level rise. So for example, if you have a caldera that's erupted, you may, um, during glacial interglacial cycles, have sea level rise that actually may mask that caldera when, and you only may discover it if you do sort of sea floor um, surveys. So our record of volcanism is incredibly incomplete. And as a result of that, it means that we've got a very sort of partial understanding of how volcanic eruptions may affect the Earth system in different ways. And in particular, in regard to these really big events, so magnitude seven and eight upwards um, within the Holocene. Um, so the past 11,000 years, we've, the biggest eruption we've seen is a magnitude of 7.4. And that was Shang Bai Shan. Um, otherwise called the millennium, millennium eruption. But as you can see, we can get a lot bigger than a 7.4. We can go up to the largest eruption um, that is known to us for the Quaternary. So the past two million years of history is the youngest Toba Tuff eruption that happened about 74,000 years ago. And that was a magnitude of 8.8. .8. And so these events are far beyond the scale that we can comprehend um, as humans and bigger than anything that we've ever experienced ourselves. But because that doesn't mean they're never going to happen again. You know, they're going to happen again. And because of that, we really want to understand how these volcanic eruptions, these really big ones, have impacted the Earth and the environment as well. And what sort of time scale, scales these operate on? So how may the effects of an eruption, how long they may persist um, and wreak havoc in different parts of the Earth? So for the oceans, the atmosphere, even the cryosphere, so the ice um, and the poles. And so really filling in these research gaps and these knowledge gaps is a sort of fundamental part of modern volcanology. And really, we, like as volcanologists, we really want to answer the questions such as how far can ash be dispersed, um, which is kind of poignant for looking at hazard modelling. As you remember, in, some of you may remember in 2010, uh, the Icelandic eruption caused all kinds of problems with air travel, because obviously planes can't fly through volcanic ash. Um, so we want to know how far this, this ash ca actually can go and what factors affect that. How long do the climate effects of explosive um, eruptions last? So volcanoes don't just have short-lived effects, they can have long-lived effects as well on the composition of the atmosphere and in turn the radiative budget of the Earth. Um, so we want to know how long these effects can last for and how severe they can be. 
And also a pretty big one, how frequently do these large eruptions occur? Because if we don't know an eruption happened, how can we then look at the return intervals? And how can we assess how often these events occur? Maybe we've just been lucky up to now. We just don't know. So it's not only identifying the effects of eruptions, but also identifying the eruptions themselves that are really key priorities. And so far, it's really been ice cores, sedimentary sequences and historical records that have been sort of used in order to try and probe the answers to these questions. But then the question that I, I guess want to take a step back and look at from a more broad perspective is, can we also use stalagmites in this? You know, because the talks that we've had so far have been fantastic at talking about how stalagmites can be used for really refined paleoclimatic interpretations. What if we took a step back and thought, could, it, could stalagmites actually be used to supplement an entire discipline, and that discipline being volcanology, and in particular paleovolcanology? And so the two kind of main sort of features of this I'm going to talk about today are firstly ash dispersal. So how we can use stalagmites to study um, the app, like how much ash can be emitted from volcanoes and how far it can go and sort of the dispersal patterns. And then secondly, how we can use stalagmites to look at how volcanoes may have affected the climate and sort of different manifestations of these across different geographical realms. So firstly is ash dispersal. So um, Stacey alluded to this in her talk earlier, whereas um, volcanic ash is emitted in very, very fine particles and these can travel in the atmosphere and be transported by winds and turbulence um, sort of hundreds, thousands of kilometres away. And if you have ashfall um, being happening in a certain area, there's a chance that this can actually leave signals in, the hyd in a hydrological system which can then feed into the stalagmite. And so there are two um, key mechanisms that could enable volcanic material to become incorporated into the growth of stalagmites. Um, and the first is alien transport. So you may just have ash being blown directly into the cave, deposited on the tip of the stalagmite, and then incorporated into the annual growth, annual um, or sort of whatever the growth pattern of the stalagmite is. Obviously, when I say annual, I'm, think, I'm think, thinking back to James's talk about that, that lovely stalagmite that had a perfectly annual um, resolution, not all are like that, of course. Um, and the second mechanism is through leaching and percolative transport. So you may have ash falling on the um, ground above the cave. Um, key sort of trace elements leaching from the ash become incorporated into the water that then feeds through the limestone, becomes incorporated into the drip aquifer, feeding the stalagmite, resulting in very enriched drip water um, being deposited on stalagmite. And then you may have these really sort of clear layers of trace element enrichment that make it look like there's something quite unusual going on and sort of manifest as really clear spikes. Um, so those are the two kind of main ways that we that you could preserve an ash signal in a stalagmite and this diagram here we included in our um, paper that was published earlier this year that kind of um, illustrates all these processes going on and how they in, in an idealized situation they could they could help us to sort of study um, ash fall from volcanic eruptions. But of course, that's an idealized situation, as we know in sort of stalagmite science or science in general, it's never a perfect situation. And so the existing studies that we do have suggest that actually geography plays a huge role in whether stalagmites can actually retain these signals. Um, so the circles that you see on the map here, um, the ones that are outlined in blue are ones where there have been sort of convincing um, enrichments of trace elements in the stalagmite growth that have been linked to um, for volcanic eruptions. A really, really key example is a study done by Bob Jameson um, in Belize, whereby they actually managed to link several really sort of really prominent trace element enrichments to volcanic eruptions between sort of period of, I think it was between 1970 and um, 1995, I think, give, give or take a few years. Um, but then they could actually combine that with satellite data as well. And you know, it was it provided a really nice example of how of the ideal situation in which you would have um, retention of a signal. So a very seasonal hydrological regime, you know, that's very cyclic. So you can so you can see that the water that's coming into the cave is coming coming um, at sort of regular points in time. It's not just sporadic. Um, but then on the other end of the scale, that sporadic um, drip regime actually was a problem for us when we took a Polish stalagmite and tried to do the same thing um, because the um, water inputs into the cave were so sporadic and because they were not so cyclic, it meant that we could, it was very difficult for us to distinguish which enrichments were volcanism 
and which could just be something else, you know, in flush events or storms or something. And it was, and when as well, when you take a solid mic that's further back in time and you can't use satellite data that Bob Jameson could, you end up kind of with, unless you've got a very, very, very clear signal, very low chronological uncertainty that you can then link to the eruption event. It's very difficult to definitively say, yeah, that's an eruption, you know, because you could, devil's advocate, you could always say, well, what if it's this, what if it's that? And so sight is particularly important. And I think that's a theme that's been kind of spoken a lot about this morning, you know, that when you are choosing your samples and when you're choosing your site, there's lots you need to think about, and particularly in response to instantaneous events like volcanism. You know, you've got a very small window of time in which you've got an event happening. And if you haven't got the chronological chronological control, sorry, you can't, it's very, very difficult to definitively link different spikes to different um, eruption events. And this is sort of enhanced as well if you've got a stalagmite that's grown very, very far away from the volcanoes um, themselves. But like I alluded to, you know, combining this stalagmite geochemistry with other sort of tools and records and methods can be quite useful. So here's a figure from Bob Jameson's paper um, where they sort of draw upon satellite data to be able to link um, geochemical enrichment to volcanism. Then we also have sort of big sort of databases of not only tephra layers, so volcanic ash layers that have been preserved in sort of lake sediments and peats, um, but you've also got databases of eruption events that are known based on geological evidence. Um, and then you also have ice cores from places like Greenland that can preserve sulfate spikes. So again, a signal of the volcanism that can be very sort of precisely linked to a certain point in time. And all of these together, we can start to kind of, in almost like a detective forensic way, start to piece together um, a record of how volcanism occurred. But like I say again, and I can't stress this enough, the site is so, so important for this. And, you know, it's, it's really about choosing a site where you can eliminate as many uncertainties as possible that volcanic ash is having a dominant effect on the cave and on the stalagmite itself. And so the second um, approach I want to talk about is how we may be able to start to look at the climate perturbation influence, um, sort of invoked by volcanic eruptions. Um, and you may be thinking, but that's not really to do with ash. Ash falls out the atmosphere really quickly. Um, the volcanic eruptions can actually affect the climate in two ways. So that's directly, so injection of volatile gases such as sulfur, um, which oxidizes to form sulfate aerosols. And these have the effect of backscattering solar radiation um, and so cooling the Earth's surface. And this evidence suggests that this direct radiative effect can last for up to 10 years. Um, so as long as the sulfate aerosols can persist in the atmosphere, which is sort of multiple years following the eruption. But then also indirectly, so the volcanic eruptions, because of these sulfate aerosols and because of the sort of re the cooling effect that it can have, it can also exert dynamical effects on the atmosphere. So sort of change how the atmosphere circulates and how it moves. And in turn, the weather patterns and the climate patterns that we um, that are caused by that. And so one approach is that we could use um, stalagmites to assess the timing and severity of abrupt climate shifts caused by volcanism um, and look at how long these persist for. So one, this is Harriet Ridley's figure down here, which I think is really, really neat because it basically shows that following the eruption, you've got, um, you've got sort of these, this movement of the intertropical convergence zone um, for multiple years after the eruption. And they invoke that by looking at the Delta 13 C. And so by looking at the wetting and drying cycles, they could actually track the movement of the intertropical convergence zone following the eruption. And what they found is that if you had, a, say, a strong northern hemisphere eruption, you had a southward migration of the ITCZ. And then, the, then with southern hemisphere eruptions, you had the opposite effect, so it moved back again. And so the evidence of this really dynamical, really sort of um, significant effect of the volcanic eruptions that aren't just limited to temperature, that's also, you know, like sort of linked to seasonality and all these complex things going on. And so we then sort of applied that idea and thought, well, what if there was, and we could obviously look at effect of larger eruptions happening over the last glacial period. So this is a figure from a paper that's in prep at the moment. Um, yeah, using a stalagmite from Dim Cave. Um, so it's almost tying back to the, um, to the broad theme of this workshop, where we looked at the, sort of the two largest eruptions with, um, that we know of between 70 and 90,000 years ago. Um, one of which is Toba, which is in Indonesia, 
and one is Atatlan, which is in Guatemala. And so we were really kind of looking to see whether there was any sort of significant geochemical shifts following these eruption events and how definitively we could say that this, this was volcanic induced. Um, and although it, of course, this, this is incredibly interesting, the fact that we see these, you know, these changes, you know, the trace elements start to increase and, you know, that may be able to be linked to be drying in the cave. Um, without a definitive eruption marker, it becomes very difficult to say this is definitely the eruption. And particularly in this case, because these eruptions precede uh, Greenland Stadial 20, which is a particularly severe um, stadial event. And so the question doesn't then become, did the volcanic eruptions cause a stadial? Because from a single stalagmite record, it becomes very difficult and almost slightly fanciful to say that. Whereas what we can do is think, okay, this stalagmite is telling us that there was a significant shift in the trace element record following this date. Could this be evidence for the volcanoes increasing the severity of the stadial event? You know, is, is, there, is there a link between the magnitude of the eruption and the magnitude of hydrological perturbation in this stalagmite. And again, this approach is very much in its infancy, but it may be useful to combine stalagmite records, sort of trace elements and isotopes as well, with other um, paleoclimate records and start to build a composite figure across sort of entire hemisphere scale and look at the timing of changes and look at how they manifest differently and think in relative to this eruption, how how does this how how can we, you know, tease out different signals? But then another issue, of course, is the eruption date uncertainty. As you can see, Atatlan has quite a significant dating uncertainty associated with it. So again, it really becomes a case of trying to refine the chronology and trying to really get those date uncertainties down as small as possible to make sort of robust um, sort of inferences from the record we have. But I think this this data, particularly from the Dim Cave stalagmites, is just that actually trace elements may be particularly useful for this rather than just looking at the isotopes, which has kind of been the traditional um, way of looking at climate perturbations. What the trace elements can tell us information that maybe the isotopes may not tell us. And so also we may be able to use stalagmites to validate climate models. And so these this is from a paper that was published this year that was looking at the climate um, implications of the Toba eruption. And they validated their model sort of inputs using paleoclimate records like stalagmites, like lake records, like ice records. And so the more stalagmites we have for this purpose, the more they may be able to supplement these models and allow us to really refine the input parameters to get a more, a sort of a better idea of how the climate system and different fa facets of the climate system respond to volcanic forcing of different magnitudes. And when I say volcanic forcing, I mean sort of different sulfur loads, different sort of time scales of eruption, all these sorts of things. Um, and I just noticed the time, so I'm going to quickly sort of summarise everything that I've um, just said, because I, I don't want to be that person who runs over for ages. So a study of ash dispersal, it's from existing evidence, it appears that not all stalagmites are suitable for this purpose. And that's one really clear point to make. Um, and so really the case becomes fight like studying stalagmites for this purpose, maybe not setting out thinking we're definitely going to find a signal, more sort of testing the idea, testing the water and sort of pushing the boundary a bit and saying, could we do it? And then we can start to really constrain sort of the factors that can affect the likelihood of retaining a volcanic signal in a stalagmite. And we can start to then create a picture of the sort of ideal situation and ideal cave morphology, stalagmite growth rate, all these sorts of things that could that lend to preservation of a volcanic signal. And obviously in incorporation of different disciplines and different techniques will further um, enhance this. And the study of climate perturbation without clear event markers, any climate oscillations can't be definitively linked to the volcanic eruption because you know, you, you know, you could argue it could be multiple different things further back in time, the uncertainties are larger. So we have to take a bit of a more broad brush approach. However, Integrated isotope and trace element studies may mean that we can start to refine the paleoclimate in interpretations that we make from these um, records and start to then look at different eruption events and different climate um, sort of backgrounds and see and just have, have a look. I think because this this field is so new and because it's such a new idea to use stalagmites in volcanology, there's so much water to be tested and there's so much wiggle room and so many cool things that we can start to look for. Um, it's just a case of trying it trying things, if it doesn't work, we know next time that it doesn't work. So 
lots of new things to discover. And so really, I think my, my answer to the question, can we start with my, I think yes, but I think we need to really invest in not just the positive outcomes of doing this, but also the negative and just accept that we're going to make mistakes, you know, as any pioneering field does, except we're going to make mistakes and really use the integrated expertise of this, uh, the stalagmite researchers, paleoclimatologists and volcanologists working in unison to minimise the uncertainties and really sort of create a, a sort of sort of build, start to build up an understanding of what actually is going on and how useful these records may be, because I think they, I think they can be really useful. But like I say, we need to be prepared to stumble a couple of times in order to um, succeed. Um, and for some reason my computer, there we go, um, just to finish a quick special, special mention to these, these names on the screen here because without these people I wouldn't have a chance to study stalagmites and I wouldn't have had a chance to pursue this research, um, this research direction and so without these guys expertise and knowledge and help um, I wouldn't be where I am today so I'm hugely hugely grateful to them and their guidance in this and they've played a huge role in my sort of career so far so thank you so much for listening and i welcome any questions or any ideas or thoughts on what I, anything i said this morning thank you alice that was great uh and lots of as you said uh, lots of things to discover still we are still really new at this and it was really nice for me uh, to listen more on explosions and explosive materials and their signals on stalagmites and 